Welcome back to Eschatology Matters on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network and available on Boniface Media. Do you want to start reading the Puritans but don't know where to begin? Well, Puritan Treasures for today from Reformation Heritage Books makes these riches of godly writers of old accessible for the modern reader. With updated language and helpful introductions, these classic works from John Owen, Jeremiah Burroughs, and more are the perfect starting point for the curious reader. Learn more about these Puritan Treasures for today at heritagebooks.org slash Puritan Treasures. If you're in the cart and your checkout, be sure to enter E Matters, the code E Matters, and you'll get 10% off your order. Um, today, I'm joined back by at least repeat guests, and I'm not sure this is two or three times, but Josh Dawes. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining me today, brother. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Is this is this round two or round three? I think it's round two. Round two? Okay, very yeah. good. We'll, 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 we'll have to, yeah, we'll get these rolling more steadily so you can get your sticker at the, I think it's the five the five right. or whatever that is <laughs> um no we josh that you've got you've got a lot going on you've got uh, a lot of writing you've been doing um we're in an election cycle um i gave you no notes on today's topic <laughs> but i'm here i'm here to plumb to plumb your brain why why are christians so bad at politics i'd like you mm. to solve this one for us today josh because um you and i were talking earlier about twitter I try to stay off Twitter every so often. I, I, you know, I dip into Twitter and social media just to see what's see what's happening. Um, Christians seem to have a real tough time navigating politics for, I think, a variety of reasons. I'm, I'm guessing you can probably pinpoint a few because I don't think there's a silver bullet answer to this. But what are some of the reasons why Christians are very, very bad at politics? I'm going to go ahead and make that my de facto case. I think Christians are bad at politics. If we can start with that presupposition, what are, what are some things you're seeing and maybe toward an eye of helping Christians navigate these political waters. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I totally agree with that presupposition. We are, uh, we are very bad at politics. Uh, and I think it's, um, I think it may have started from, from reasonable, um, I don't know, good motivations. Like mm -hmm. you know, we, we saw, uh, churches that were all in on, you know, huge 4th of July spectacles with, you know, the, stage adorned with american flags and there was this the you know i think coming out of the 80s and 90s there was kind of this reluctance to kind of you know be uh be as out front with our patriotism and um and maybe the church uh to some degree had started to conflate you know being american with being uh christian and there's been this kind of push to kind of separate that uh, the problem with that is that uh, once you kind of convince the church that the church shouldn't be political, we should stay out of politics, let's focus on the gospel, uh, then you've given the left a runway to get us out of all areas of life because they keep encroaching and making everything political. And mm -hmm. so suddenly, I think we found ourselves in a place where the church is kind of boxed, boxed into this really narrow, you know, little gospel corner that we've painted ourselves into uh, because we can't touch anything that's political. And now that everything is political, um, I think the church is struggling to figure out wh wh what can we talk about? Yeah, I, I, I totally sympathize with the um, and I, I think we've brought it up on here before, but the, you know, the 4th of July celebrations, I remember vividly the first time I saw um, large mega church and they unfurled the American flag and it literally kind of covered up the cross you know, mm. behind the behind the pulpit, and it was like, man, whatever that is, that's not it. So, yeah. like, I, I I sympathize with that that impetus. I think also politics is just unpleasant for a lot of Christians. I just get that sense from a lot of the the the, the you know just rank and file you know believers in the pew. They they just find mm -hmm. it very unpleasant business. It seems to bring out divisiveness within people. Um, I, let, let me push in on this, Josh, because you you had commented on uh, our mutual friend Jamie Bambrick, um, who if if any of our viewers aren't following his channel, you should follow his. Um, but Jamie put out a video. I don't remember what the title was. It was it was about something about Christians being more politicized or or something to that effect. Um, but he was talking about the creep into the the various spheres. So mm -hmm. essentially, his point, among others, but like kind of his, I think his main point was that politics things have become politicized within all these spheres. So even when you just mentioned not separating or the separation of church and politics, 
for a lot of Christians, that becomes the separation of Christ and politics. Can you walk, if somebody's not familiar with those categories, can you maybe walk them into that idea? Because I think that's what, what you were commenting on from his video, if I recall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he put that out yesterday. It was um, recent. Yeah. And it was, um, yeah, it's just making the case that Christians need to be more political, not less. And I, I think that it gets to that kind of encroachment of everything has become so political. And if we're, if that's our guiding principle, if our guiding pr principle is that as Christians, we need to avoid politics or we need to abstain from uh, being political, then we're going to have less and less influence, um, less and less uh, opportunities to bring Christ to bear on the issues that that are, you know, really, really important uh, and going on in culture. Um, because, you know, we can't talk to, uh, you know, a lot of the gender ideology stuff that's happening in schools because, oh, that's political. We don't want to we don't right. want to weigh in on that. And, and you find yourself just kind of, um, I don't know, I, I think a lot of just average Christians in the pew are looking to our leaders and we're facing all this stuff at work and at school and our leaders um, are kind of taking a hands-off approach in a lot of cases. And it's just kind of left uh, left the people in the pews kind of, um, I don't know, feeling adrift. Like, what? how do I respond to this? It's not being modeled well. And so I hear a lot of, a lot of pastors and leaders uh, expressing frustration that people are being more discipled by social media and cable news. And, and, and I want to say that that's because they're not finding that discipleship at church. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not talking about those issues that we're facing in our everyday lives. And in the absence of that, that that void is going to be filled by other voices. And so I would just encourage, you know, pastors, church leaders to step into those conversations and not leave that vacuum that other voices are going to fill. Yeah, which I mean, th that kind of cuts back to the whole. Because again, I think I think for a lot of Christians, we're, we're operating out of a reaction against things we've seen that we don't like, or, or that mm -hmm. we, you know. So, like for a lot of Christians, you know, you, you've got the specter, and I don't think I've ever actually seen this in person, but I have the picture in my mind somehow, you know, you know of the pastor entering the pulpit, and you get, you know, he kind of reads off his candidate card, and here's who you need to vote for for city council, and so like an over politic politicization. But you're just talking about so okay. Answer me this, Josh. Let me let me because I want I want you to talk more about this, and I'm I'm trying to trying to frame this. If you if you were to think of like Kyperian sphere sovereignty, just like a general conception of um, God has instituted various spheres. There's church, there's state, there's family. I would also argue for a fourth of individual, but you know, in general, there's these spheres. They have some overlap, but they're distinct. Um, and you see this one of the state or of the political realm seeming to encroach and you know, kind of uh, overtake spheres that are not its proper authority. I, I can think of many examples, and, and so can you, right, of, of, of ways in which the modern state has taken uh, roles to itself that are just simply not its to take. Mm -hmm. What's the risk, though, of, of Christians kind of validating that by engaging in politics? In other words, I think a lot of Christians, when they think of these things, they may not be thinking of sphere sovereignty categories, but I think there's kind of a reaction of like, well, that shouldn't be political. You know what I mean? Like, how, how can we yeah. engage in that those political issues without essentially acquiescing to or giving that that over to the state kind of validating their their encroachment on those spheres yeah well i think to, to back it up a bit i think there's a misunderstanding amongst a lot of christians about what politics actually is it, mm -hmm. it's it's really more about um how we're going to live together in this society what are the rules that are going to govern us what what are our laws going to be how how should those those separate spheres interact with each other um, how, where is their overlap? Where are the borders of those spheres? And so the, the process of politics is just our coming together of how we figure that out, how right. we, we do that. So in that sense, I don't know that there's, there's, I, I feel like so for so many years we lived in this kind of, I don't know, uh, illusion that, you know, things could be not political. And I, I almost think we were kind of, um, I don't know. That was just, that just wasn't reality. At least naive, everything. Right? Yeah. It, it was naive. Yeah. And so I, I don't, uh, I get the ickiness that, that politics itself, like the, the process can get really ugly. There's a lot of bad actors in it. And as Christians, we want to, you know, engage in politics in a, a Christ-like manner, uh, obviously. Um, 
but uh, separating from that is is essentially giving up the field. You know, it's like we're not going to have a say in how the 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 sphere sovereignty is is governed and what our laws are going to be. We're going to sit back and uh, there's a lot of um, I think looking to kind of like well we'll just focus on the gospel and all that other stuff will work itself out. Uh, we know who wins in the end. So you know if suffering comes, then that's you know the the fertile ground where the church is going to thrive. And so let's just uh, accept that and leave all that, um, you know, to, to other people. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's frustrating to me because I, I feel like we have a duty, you know, we've been placed in this context, uh, blessed with the opportunity uh, in, to live in a Republic with self-government. And that requires you know, uh, Christians to um, to step up and to be a participant in that uh, or else, you know, we're just handing it over to the enemy. Yeah. And OK, so so maybe this. So so, you know, my, my question at the front end was, you know, why are Christians seemingly really bad at politics? Um, and I, I, I think I think that's just kind of a de facto yeah, uh, reality. I think Christians are bad at politics. Is it just simply from the fact that we've gotten very used to abandoning politics like intentionally not engaging in politics hence you're you're bad at it because that what you just brought up i think that would be the reaction of a lot of christians is we preach the gospel which yes and amen right um yeah. we, we we want to see people saved we need to see revival or, or at least you know souls won to christ and all of that yes and amen but it's almost as if that is pitted against some sort of political involvement mm-hmm. I mean, is, yeah. is that one of the reasons why we've been bad at politics? We've simply like this is, you know, we've forgotten how to ride the bike because we've intentionally not gotten on it for so long. I think that's part of it. Um, I, I think most evangelicals uh, don't really have any memory to pull from. It, it, I think we were yeah. handed um, this uh, kind of neutral secular uh, world that kind of emerged out of the 60s, that post-war liberal consensus that, you uh, so many uh, talk about on on Twitter. We'll get into <laughs> right. that if you want to, um, but just we 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 kind of came up in this world where uh, we we saw the public square as this kind of neutral space where these ideas just uh, you know the the marketplace of ideas and um, we just kind of trust that you know if we can keep a, a neutral space. Um, you know, the best ideas will rise to the top and right. we can just kind of stay over here in our little silo and and focus on the gospel and trust that that's all going to work itself out. Um, but what we fail to recognize is that um, it is the, the use of political power um, and how that can be used uh, to hinder the, the gospel. You know, uh, we we're seeing, you know, Justice Department arresting, um, putting people in in jail that are protesting um against abortion and right. and things like that. And so it's it, the the enemies of God are not afraid to use political power and and I think as Christians we need to be become more comfortable with um with acquiring political power and then using it to do what government has, you know, God's instituted government for is to promote good and to punish evil. And and I, I think Christians for too long have just kind of set back and let that kind of take care of itself because we had this perfect system that was founded in 1776 that is just running along nicely and we can just you know focus on our thing while that that uh, kind of runs itself right well and that's what that's what makes it so fascinating you know especially among like the reformed world or or at least at least uh, you know the realms of christianity that would accept the threefold use of the law is that we've become very reticent to engage with the political sphere because, like you just pointed out, that would that would go you know hand in hand with one of the uses of the law, which is the restraint of evil. I think, you know, if you if you were to look to political engagement, like and again, we're in twenty twenty four, and it's you know we're coming up on the uh, the election month, and so everybody's just kind of uh, tired of getting all the text messages on their phone, tired of the politics, uh, or at least I am. Um, so I get I get that impetus, but I don't think anybody would look back to like the abolition of the slave trade. And be like, man, it would have been greater if they had just focused on the gospel. I know that might be a simplistic or a broad brushstroke, but that that's political engagement, through yeah. which God accomplishes good ends by His means. You know, which is again the threefold use of the law. How how do you like how do you revive that within Christianity? Or maybe are you seeing some of that revival in Christianity? It seems like there's been some resourcement as of late. Um, I know Zach Garris, a mutual friend of ours, he's been posting a lot of of kind of resourcement material, but 
what what are you seeing with that josh yeah i really think you know there's a lot of conversation around christian nationalism and whether or not that's a a good term sure um i i really think there's pockets of that that are really about um kind of reinvigorating that uh these kind of conversations within evangelical circles that you know we we um we need to recover the will to govern from a christian moral framework uh it you know our country was founded upon those principles uh it didn't need to be laid out in uh the constitution because that was just the presupposition that this group of people that were banding together to form a new nation that was the that was the world they were they were inhabiting uh, it right. was just a given and uh, and so now i think as we're trying to recover a lot that was lost and um and i think you know the the best parts of christian nationalism that that i would identify with are are not you know trying to just completely tear everything down and and come up with something new and install a christian prince it's really a recovery effort of like what what um have we lost and how can we get back to that how can we re uh, establish a christian nation that is um governing from a christian moral framework that that yeah. rightly sees drag queen story hour as a a curse and not a blessing of liberty and like mm-hmm. I, that's that's the kind of um that's the kind of uh, uh i think project that that christian nationalism is trying to recover amongst christians yeah it's, it seems like a lot of the, I guess, some of the building that I would like to see, um, because I, I think I think that a good view of government would be a, a, a good biblical view of government would be a very limited government. Um, I mm-hmm. think there's a pretty strong case to be made there that that most would sympathize with. Um, I know Doug Wilson's talked a lot about that. Um, some Somehow of. So, you, you know, you mentioned kind of the broad Christian nationalist camp, which I know for for some of our viewers, that'll kind of peg it in a certain category. But like just in that broad movement, right, um, how to encourage the application of godly politics and godly rule of law and yet with a very limited sphere. I think maybe that's where I'm seeing some of the conversation and, and I, I would love your input on this. It seems that I'm seeing a lot of people talk past each other because when they hear things like Christian nationalism or God's law, they're hearing like a bloated, oppressive government, even uh-huh. if it's like functioning from godly parameters. It's like, man, this is like they're going to be looking over my shoulder while I'm reading in the den type thing. You know what I mean? How do you how, yeah. like what are, what are you seeing with that conversation? Maybe how do you encourage godly law, godly rule, all the things we've been talking about? And yet with a really small or at least limited government compared to what we have today. Yeah. And, and I think that's the big challenge for a lot of the guys in the Christian nationalist camp. Um, it that conversation can be so high level and theoretical and you know even like the the concept of a christian prince it it, you know from my reading of it and my reading of stephen wolf it's not about a literal person it's the the concept of a a a government that is you know governing from a christian perspective and so i think there needs to be a lot of work um apply to what does that look like what does that look like in my county right. you know what would a a, a christian uh, city council look like and and i think um once you begin to put flesh on that uh, i think that gives uh that's going to settle a lot of the nerves of of skittish christians when they hear those terms like you know imagine a a city council that refuses to do a pride ce- celebration in uh in june it's like we're not doing that we're not having uh you know the elementary schools will not be uh putting up rainbow flags uh in any of the schools um the sheriff you know is uh refusing to um you know kind of exercising that uh, lesser magistrate right you know doctrine and refusing to enforce uh you know laws you know handed down from the federal government and and, and you kind of see that like okay this could work you know, within our limited government framework uh, to uphold a Christian morality, a public uh, morality that, um, you know, uh, that elevates the good and restrains evil. Yeah. Yeah. We've got um, I've got some family members that live in a let's just say an undisclosed county because I don't want to put them on blast. But their sheriff was very much you know, articulating, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know that he used any of the the verbiage, but articulating that lesser magistrate doctrine concerning a lot of the current political issues. Let's just say he said, it's not going to, it's not going to come into this County, even Mm -hmm. if I have to violate 
um, federal mandates, which I thought was fascinating. The the, the thing I, I think one of the reasons why this does not. So you know you you mentioned the the post post war liberal consensus earlier. Just in general, though, like I think I think the, the one of the reasons why this is so foreign to Christians is we think of. Um, we think of federal overarching nationalist authorities as maybe like the the ideal or the most valid or the most uh, like we we look to those things instinctively. And I know there's a lot of reasons for that. We could talk about the political theory behind those things. But, you know, you think to police officers, well, what, what are the best police officers? Well, they're going to probably be the federal police officers. Um, what are the best courts? They're going to be the we, we, we looked we, we've at least I grew up in an environment in which it seemed like everything stepped up. It was a promotion to go up to the state level and then the mm-hmm. federal level. I think it's why localism has been so fascinating for Christians is we've completely missed where the power or at least the authority and the the real strength of the matter should lie. Um, yeah. And when that gets back to our, our ickiness with politics, we in a lot of ways, we want our politics to be done every four years. At the ballot box, we will vote the right way and then forget about it. I don't yep. want to. This is yucky. I don't like it. Let's just put our head back in the you sand. Wash your hands so, after you're done, and you yeah. yeah. And and unfortunately, that's not how we're going to see a lot of the changes we'd like to see as Christians. They're not going to come down from on high. Um, right. You know, I'm I'm supporting Trump this year. I'm not expecting him to solve all of our problems. Uh, that's going to come. Um, more from getting more involved in the political process, not less on the local level. If we don't like the candidates we're seeing, that's our fault because we're not involved in the party politics and the back, you know, back uh, the smoke filled rooms and right. all that stuff that, you know, we don't want to be, you know, sully our hands with, but that's where these decisions are made. That's where the party platform is determined. Uh, that's where the candidates that are going to be running uh, for office in local elections, that's where they're going to be determined. So if we want to have a say in all of that, and we want uh, to change the the party, we want to change and make sure it's becoming more pro-life, not less, then that is the the hard work that we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and begin to do. Yeah. And, and also encourage within the church, because I don't, you know, I'm, I serve as a pastor. I don't want I don't want my church dominated by politics, nor do I want to just ignore, you know, like you talked about earlier, the the political, um, inevitable political intersections with the uh, with the church that that exist. But I, I, I'm just, I'm, again, I'm thinking of my own experiences. I've never once, um, well, I've, I've always heard pastors encourage that we need good Christian politicians. That that's pretty standard, right? Mm-hmm. Every, every pastor almost will say, like, we really need them. I've never seen it encouraged in the church, and I've seen it discouraged dozens of times. Mm-hmm. Where some some young man will be like, "I'm thinking about politics," and you know the the arm comes around the shoulder. And it's like, "Whoa, there, yep. Jimmy, <laughs> that will ruin you." And and to be fair, like I understand, like yeah, warn Jimmy, that's a lion's den. But to discourage it, it's, it just seems so counterintuitive and endemic. I think within evangelicalism, you, I mean, is my experience al- uh, alone, or are you seeing this as well? No, no I definitely see this as well, and. Um, just in our own, you know, church, um, in the last few years, we had someone run for, I think, state Senate. And it was, it was kind of frustrating. It was like, it, it, we all, you know, it, it felt like most people were just like, let's not acknowledge that. Let's not talk about it. Let's not, um, rally around him and support him in this. And, uh, it just, um, I, I don't know. There's, it's that reluctance to like, Ooh, this is the, it's the gross, thing that he's doing i don't know that we should support this um and he you know i haven't talked to him about it but i would imagine he probably felt a little abandoned by his church like hey right. i'm trying to do something here where are you guys at and uh and i i just you know i wish uh i wish the church could be more about that and and in um you know talking to young people i think this goes all the way back because you know most uh local offices are part-time jobs. They're not going to be your main source of income. And so even the choices we encourage our kids to make as they're growing up and, you know, getting out into the world, if we're pushing them towards the kind of like, you know, corporate wage slave, you know, sell your your time for money um, pursuits, you know, they're not going to have those opportunities to, you know, run for office in the future. And so I think it's it's a kind of a holistic thing of like, what is the vision we're casting for our kids? Like as they're, as we're raising them up and launching them out into the world, 
are we preparing them to be the kind of people and to live the kind of lives, to make the kind of career choices that are going to enable them to be the Wilbur forces that can, you know, step into these realms and actually, you know, make an impact for the kingdom. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think, I think most Christians, myself included, vastly underestimate the power that those local positions can hold. Um, we, we have, we have a gentleman in our church and, uh, anyway, local measure, and it was going to bring a CD business into the area. And he was part of the, you know, group that was just like, nah, we're not going to have that in our community. And it's not here. So it's, it's like every day I enjoy that because, you know, I don't even know what the, the pay, I, it's, it's certainly not a full-time position, but it's like that, that, that has massive impact on what the community looks like. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking toward like how to encourage that, not only with, with Christians, with pastors, I'm wondering if you have any um, I, I didn't prep you for this. So my apologies, Josh, but like any, any resources or even any ways to encourage your church? Cause I'm thinking toward, you know, obviously, like I said, we're, we're in a political cycle and I know that's always, you know, a challenging time for any church, but just to encourage our people to not only think about politics, but not just think about politics in the every four years, I really hope my one candidate solves all the world's problems, but instead just kind of encouraging that, like that localism, that community building, everything you've been talking about. Um, have you found any resources that were particularly helpful for you maybe, or, or things you would point people to that are trying to encourage that in a healthy way, again, not an imbalanced way, but a healthy way in their church? What do you think? Yeah, that's something I'm definitely, uh, on the lookout for. Uh, yeah. I definitely see the need for that. Um, I've got, um, some guy, there's some guys I, I want to have on the podcast, uh, soon that are really good about, um, being involved locally just to kind of create, you know, I, I want to have that conversation to kind of help people recognize, okay, here are the first steps. How do you get involved? How do you begin right. to see this, you know, um, this change on the local level? Um, but I recently had uh, Seth Gruber on my podcast, um, uh, pro-life activist, and he's got, um, his organization is interesting. They do a lot of training uh, to help people um, learn how to start uh, abortion uh, ministries that go to the 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 clinics and how to do that uh, sidewalk ministry there, and so they're uh, really focused on on training and how to get involved in the local level and a political level. Um, you know, as as you know, I was recently talking to him. It's like after Roe v. Wade, um, we you know before that we were kind of the church was like, okay, we will support the crisis pregnancy center. And that'll be kind of our checkbox, but there's nothing more we can do because this is a federal issue and right. Roe v. Wade has our hands tied. Well, that's not the case anymore. It's back to the states. It is uh, it is a local battle in every state in uh, the union. And so this is a, an opportunity for churches to really uh, get involved. And uh, I think Seth's organization is doing a good job of, of training uh, people on the ground level. Excellent. Yeah, I, I know I've also seen a lot out about a, it's probably a derail a little bit, but um, IVF and some of those mm -hmm. related issues. Um, there's some Christian. I'm trying to think who's done good work on that. A couple of guys have been talking a lot about that lately, though. And I think that's an important one for Christians. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let me let me ask you. Let me put you on on blast for this one tweet I saw um, because you tweet um, your tweets are not as good as the based Theobot tweets but they're still pretty good. Um, <laughs> which I've still got, a, I'm still just like amazed that you created a, a based Theo bot, but th this was the tweet. And I want you to walk me into this because th this, this really, um, yeah, I think, I think it's a key area and it's one I'm, I'm very interested in. You said, why do the societies most shaped by Christianity have the clearest grasp of natural law? You remembering this one? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, while those least influenced, often des descend into barbarism. Could it be that natural law is only truly discernible within the framework of Christendom? So th that was the tweet. I'm very interested in this on multiple levels, but I think I think it coincides well with what we've been talking about, because when you have these conversations about not, not necessarily sphere sovereignty, but when it comes to political action, when it comes to um, lawmaking and governance and culture building, or at least culture governing, culture structuring, natural law comes into that conversation a lot of times. Um, I have a rather dim view of natural law. Oftentimes um, there, there's a thing of that out there. And yet I'm, I'm also mindful of the effects of depravity and the noetic curse or the noetic effects of, of the curse. Walk me into the, what you were getting at with that tweet a little bit. Yeah, that was kind of in response to um, the cross politic uh, episode last week where they had uh, Paul Miller on uh, to uh, 
kind of debate, um, I guess, their version of Christian nationalism and whether or not, uh, you know, Christianity itself should have an influence on our laws. Um, or if Which was just, a fascinating episode, too. It was so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, uh, Miller's kind of, uh, he kept falling back to natural laws. Like, we don't need the Bible. We don't need Christianity. Um to you know inform our laws because we have natural law and and just the, the interaction he had with the guys i thought they had, they did they had some great pushback on that but that got me thinking that like um just about natural law in general i think we tend to um a lot of these guys are, that are big believers in natural law seem to um I don't know. It's like you can't have that uh, that appreciation of natural law without the underpinnings uh, uh, underpinnings of the Christian society that is holding it up. Right. And now that the the Christian foundation is being washed away, um, it's like we're we're trying to hang everything on natural law that's just floating there in midair, and it's not right. it's not going to hold it. It's going to collapse. And so you know that tweet was just kind of pointing out that like all of these other. Um, you know, civilizations that are not based, you know, did not, you know, get birthed out of Christendom and Christianity. Um, they don't seem to have the same understanding. I know the law is written on our hearts and, and, you know, we all are, are guilty, um, you know, or, or, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're liable account. for it. We're, we're liable for it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. But I don't think that we can have that proper understanding. Uh, it's, it's certainly not to a degree where we can like, you know, form a civilization uh, without that that revealed um, knowledge, you right. know, that the special revelation uh, that that makes it all make sense. That's why I find like I find the natural law angle. Maybe it's more direct because you, you, you were talking earlier. I don't think you used the term, but you're kind of kind of referring to that. uh that uh, negative world conception, right? Like positive, neutral, negative world that Aaron Wren uh, popularized and or maybe he came up with it. But um, you were kind of referring to that. And I think sometimes people get a little lost with that, uh, or at least from my interactions, like they'll be kind of trying to think historically through cultural shifts. And it's like, eh, I'm not sure. Natural law, I feel like it cuts to the core of if we're going to make good laws on what do people rely for those laws? Because again, it, it coincides exactly with with the negative world conception. But you're, you're looking around and saying, well, people will come up with good things because you know the the laws written in our hearts. And it's like, well, yes, but like you just kind of loosely quoted Romans one. Yeah, we, it's there, but we suppress it in unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. And people come up with some pretty terrible ways that they think justice should be enacted. Like it's um, there. There was a point in which in our country, if there was naked men gyrating in parades in front of minors, they they would have been at least arrested, if not something far more severe. Now we're looking around and saying, no, this is actually good. Not not just mm -hmm. permissible, but good. That's that's why I find I, I find it so compelling for Christians that we hang so much weight on natural law. And the natural law, like you've pointed out, is it's dependent on something. And we've been kind of riding the the detritus of that uh of that thing that it was that it was on. Why is that such yeah. a temptation for Christians? And again, I'm not just trying to knock anybody who necessarily hangs a whole lot of weight on natural law i'd love to have those those discussions with them but i think it's a temptation for a lot of christians to see it that way why, why do you think that might be what's your take on that i just think it's the the world we grew up in it's it's yeah. I, I i don't know it i think it's there's a good impulse not to blow everything up you know i think a lot of these guys they, they don't want to overreact let's not overreact let's not overreact and um yeah, I, 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 you know, I'm trying. I try to have be charitable in the understanding um, of their perspective, um, but I just think it's like at one point the guys asked him, like, "But by what standard?" And he, and right. Miller seemed kind of confused by that. Like, "What do you mean? It's natural law?" And it's like, "Yeah, but there's got to be something holding it up. Like, where, where you can't you? It's like the the unmoved mover. You've got to it, it's got to terminate. It's something that is the final standard, right? And and I I, I want to ask these guys, and I, I'm friends with with some of them. Um, what you know? Because I, I I think Andrew Walker, a uh, friend of mine, um, would fall into this camp. Um, and I but I want to, and I think he would be okay, like governing according to a Christian moral framework. But the moment we write that down, whoa, that's too far. Right. And it's like, okay, but why? 
just because we haven't. And I think, I think a lot of times there's a reliance on tradition that, um, yeah, I, and I think we're afraid to uh, reevaluate maybe some mistakes that the founders made. Um, yeah. You know, John Adams famously said, you know, this constitution was made only for a, a religious and moral people. It's not suitable for the government, uh, governance of anybody else or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, if that's the case, then that's not us anymore. So what does that mean? And I think um, we just need to be more comfortable having those conversations. So if we want the Christian moral framework that our founders had in place when at the founding, okay, we can't just uh, assume that now, that it, it needs to be a bit more formalized. And, right. um, you know, a lot of these guys would say, well, you know, we can't have a Christian nation unless everybody in it is, is saved, um, is Christian. Um, I don't, I don't know. You can have a Christian school, um, and you don't, that doesn't require everyone. It, it's more about what is, what are the guiding principles of this school? I, I just, I've yet to hear a compelling answer to why can't we have that for a nation? What are, you know, these are the, the driving, uh, forces behind this, um, you know, the guiding principles behind this nation. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the by what standard question in that interview was, yeah, I, 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 I chuckled as well because it, it did seem to be like a little bit of a tire screech, which is funny because that's kind of like the presuppositional, you know, this is my card, <laughs> you know, by what standard yeah. it got thrown down. But I, I do think that cuts to it. We had we had a conversation with a, with a brother on on this channel. Um, it's been a while now, but but we were discussing, you know, murder laws, for example. And that was that was essentially the 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 argument being made was, well, murder is wrong. Um, and we should want it to be wrong because there's enough Christians in the country or in the culture that support murder being wrong. But you can't say murder is wrong because God says in the Ten Commandments murder is wrong, because that would be some sort of formalization of Christianity or some sort of Christian nationalism or theonomy or, you know, fill in the blank with your your uh, taboo word. Um, but the point is, well, number one, you don't want just public consensus to be the driving force behind morality. I think most of right. us could agree with that. But mm -hmm. you, you also you want it to be grounded in something something tangible because there have been many civilizations throughout world history that quite liked murder and, and we're, we're quite fine with it. That's not just something that we inherently come up with. The, the the visceral reaction, and I know there's a lot of nuance to these conversations, but the visceral reaction against saying our nation should prohibit murder because God prohibits murder. That's just uh -huh. very strange to me that 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 reaction against it from Christians. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, for so many years, like the the big thing in the pro life movement was like, do not say that you're pro life because of your Christian convictions. Like, we've got to come to this, you know, completely out of secular terms, uh, right. or else our argument doesn't, you know, hold any water. And it's I I, I saw um, Abby Johnson uh, tweet recently that. You know, she, she was kind of rejecting that. Like, no, my my pro life beliefs are because I'm a Christian, and, right. and I'm I'm encouraged to see more and more of that. That we're kind of uh, recognizing that no, it, it's okay to say I believe this because I'm a Christian, and because yeah. it's true. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's it's very it's very I don't know. To to me, it's always been just a little bit unsettling to. I don't want to use the wrong term here, but just it, it feels like sneaking it in. Like I'm I'm a Christian, but. You know, I'm going to try to make an argument, you know, murders, we don't want to murder because it makes the streets quite bloody. Um, but really, I think it's about the Ten Commandments. But um, no, it's it's a it's a fascinating conversation. I'm, I'm glad to see a lot of, I think, retrieval of these things. You know, election cycles are a tricky business. Um, I, I'm seeing it seems like post covid, which I know everybody's hanging everything on post covid, but it seems like post covid. There's been a lot of good retrieval where we started to notice. I think a lot of it had to do with church state spheres. But we, we've started to notice that there's a lot of things that seem to be in the wrong camp. There, there seem to be things, you know, authorities that are given to certain people or to certain spheres that, that don't belong there. Um, if I'm being too vague, I'm, I'm talking about like we started to realize the state was doing things the state did not seem to be biblically warranted to do or uh -huh. authorized to do. And, and it has brought a lot of retrieval for Christians. I think that can be healthy with some of what you were talking about earlier, that kind of like day in, day out political involvement as opposed to like once every four years type political involvement. But um, you've been a big part of that, Josh. Uh, where where can people follow you? Me be sure to mention the podcast, what you're working on right now. You're on the Twitter machine. Um, yeah. Where you at, brother? Yeah. Uh, best place to find me is at uh, X, I guess. Um, 
uh, at Josh Dawes. I'm there, um, but I'm also the host of uh, the Great Awakening podcast. Uh, you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts or on YouTube. And um, yeah, I'm currently working on a, a book for Canon Press called The Idol of Evangelism. So I'm uh, trying to get that uh, that first draft done uh, by the end of the year. And so I'm kind of head down writing a ton right now. Man, that's awesome. Uh, and and you said not a projected publishing date as of yet on that one? Uh, sometime next year. Sometime next year. Okay. So 2025, The Idol of Evangelism. Yep. Do you have a do you have an elevator pitch for that one by chance? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a provocative title, um, but it's really about the uh the kind of seeker sensitive movement and the church growth strategies and how that has uh kind of I don't know, uh misformed our understanding of evangelism as if it is something uh that if conversions were up to us. So you know, John Piper uh, definition of an idol is anything that we look to to provide something that only God can provide. And so when we look to our evangelistic work to produce converts, then it has become an idol uh, in, in that uh, formulation. And so I just look at all of the different ways that plays out. So I've got a chapter on contextualization or finding you know, your, your target audience, um, uh, a chapter on um, uh, removing obstacles and how, you know, that leads to unhitching the Bible or the Old Testament and whispering about sexuality because we got to get rid of those obstacles. And it's just, you know, so many different ways that uh, that has left uh, the church unprepared for the negative world we find ourselves in. Oh, find ourselves in. Yeah, yeah. No, that you're hitting on a couple of them there, man. I, I will be looking forward to that coming out. But um, yeah, Josh, thanks so much for joining me. Always a pleasure, brother. Yeah, thanks for having me. Right hand, the Lord to my Lord did command for all these ye that I will make a kingly footstool for your sake. The Lord.